All right, well today we're gonna to talk about the need for speed, and really it's all about high-speed thermal infrared cameras. Does anybody remember like about a year, year and a half ago, there was a lot of, a lot of news around airbags and recalls, right? And I, I grabbed this offline from Car and Driver Magazine, but during, <laughs> during the crash, the airbag inflators can break apart, right? And shoot large fragments of metal through the bag, which is pretty scary, right? Because airbag's supposed to be protecting you, and this could be happening. The reason I bring this up is the sense that uh, it's a pretty high speed event and there's a lot of thermal event behind it. So here we see a high speed infrared camera, so our camera image of it. Now how do you measure temperature on something that's moving fast and it's heating up very, very quickly? If we think about traditional forms of temperature measurement, thermal couples or RTDs, we have to mount them, it just doesn't make sense. You're not going to mount a bunch of thermal couples to an air bat as it, as it deploys. At the same time, if we look at non-contact forms of temperature measurement, we're talking about spot pyrometers. And those are a single point of temperature measurement, so it gets us closer. And then you look at infrared cameras, and now we get hundreds of thousands of points of temperature measurement, um, so we can really thermally characterize the device, but they're, they're kind of slow. 60 frames a second, 120 frames a second, so really not fast enough to achieve this type of an application until now. So the latest detector technologies actually allow you uh, to capture at thousands or tens of thousands of frames per second of high speed thermal imagery. And with snapshot speeds that are short enough to actually stop motion on things like an airbag so you can get accurate temperature measurements. And this helps for a lot of different reasons and, and product uh, improvements are one of them. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, is we're going to talk uh, briefly about how to stop motion on high-speed thermal events, as well as what fast frame rates really mean in the thermal realm. And we're also going to look at long-wave IR advantages. So FLIR's releasing some new detector technologies, uh, Type 2 SLS, uh, filtered to the long wave, and some of the advantages that brings beyond the mid-wave camera we talked about at DCS last year. And then we we're going to do a demonstration, as it turns out, uh, <laughs> We, we had some uh, party snappers, which look really cool on high-speed infrared, but they got packed up with our booth. So I can't show you a demonstration, so instead I'm gonna show you a really cool video we released where we took a high-speed visible camera and an infrared camera, synchronized them, and we went out to the gun range and blew up a bunch of watermelons. So it's gonna be a fun video if you guys stick around for that long. Sound good? All right, let's go ahead and dive in. So there's kind of two different types of detector technologies. Uh, one of them is a thermal detector, which you'll, you'll know is microbolometers, and the second is a photon counting detectors, which we're thinking about like Mercad, Cadmium, Telluride, Insby, or this new Type 2 strain layered super lattice. Some of the advantages of microbolometers are that they're uh, low size, weight, and power. So they don't require cryogenic cooling, um, they're a lot lower cost. Some of the disadvantages is when you look at snapshot speeds, how long it takes to take a frame, it's like six to 12 milliseconds, which is really fast for us, but in the infrared and visible camera spectrum, that's like forever. It, it's just too long of exposure times. Uh, also that leads to frame rates that are closer to about 60 hertz. Now if we look at the photon counting detectors, so we're talking about the high speed thermal cameras, now we get snapshot speeds all the way down to 210 nanoseconds. So really, really short so we can stop motion on these high speed targets, as well as frame rates much larger than 1,000 frames per second. It also lets us trigger the camera too. So let's kind of unpack that a little bit more. If we look at thermal uh, microbolometer cameras, they have a time constant. Remember I just said it was like six to 12 milliseconds. But the thing is for it to actually get to an accurate temperature measurement, it takes multiple time constants. So the chart you guys see behind me kind of demonstrates that. So let's imagine an infrared camera, a microbolometer, and we are looking at a zero Celsius black body. So it's seeing just zero C temperature. Uh, then by the next frame, instantaneously, we put a 100C black body in there. The first time constant will be half of the way there. We'll be at 50C if we were to take that measurement. The second one, we'd be at 75C, then 87.5. And then the math gets confusing. I have to look at the slide. So what is it, 90, 93.75. But it takes about five time constants for it to fully transition to the next temperature range. So really, when we think about it, accurate temperature measurements aren't six milliseconds it's six times five, so about 30 milliseconds before you get an accurate temperature reading. So really these don't work for the types of applications when we're really thinking high speed thermal events. In contrast, or I guess on the flip side of that, if we look at the photon counting cameras, I like to use analogy like uh, buckets in a rain, in, in, under, under like a rain cloud. And so if we look at a 20C black body, we have a certain amount of photons that are coming out. And the detector, basically, when those hit the detector, we're collecting that, that charge in an integration capacitor. 
So kind of like a bucket, right? Um, and the colder the target, the less photons, the hotter the target, the more photons. So as you can imagine, the integration time or snapshot speed uh, to capture a frame, if you're looking at a hotter, hotter target, is much shorter as you'd expect, and it's much longer for the colder targets. So that's kind of how they work. And if we, we look at a real world example, we took one of our cars and just jacked it up and, and you have to disable like the, the braking system, basically tell the computer it's okay. And, and we cranked it up to 40 miles per hour. So it's just spinning there on a jack. Um, and we looked at it with one of our photon counting cameras and you can see it's stop motion. I, I promise you we didn't stop the car and then take the picture. So we're able to stop motion. Now we can get accurate temperature measurement. But if we look at the image on the right, it's a thermal resistive element, so the microbolometer, and we get smearing. So getting accurate temperature measurement on this is, is just not going to happen in that instance. So this is a real world example to give you an idea. So we've learned that it's essential for, to do stop motion and fast frame rates. You need a photon counting camera. Let's talk a little bit more about frame rates. <clears throat> so ha can we just go as fast as we want to? As long as the readout integrated circuit technology supports it? Well, the answer is, depends on what you're looking to do. If you want accurate temperature measurement, it's going to be difficult to just push the limit as far as you can go. So sometimes you'll see cameras out there that are advertised that say 90,000 frames per second. Fantastic, right? Really fast frame rates. But if we just uh, assume 1 over 90,000, we get an integration time of about 11.1. Um, probably have to be a little bit lower than that because there's some overhead, but let's just say 11.1 microsecond integration time. Well, we talked about if you don't have a hot target, 11.1 microseconds isn't a lot of time to collect energy into that integration capacitor. So we may not be able to get enough energy to actually get a good reading or get a good temperature measurement or imagery at that frame rate. The other thing is uh, on the readout integrated circuit, when we're not capturing data, filling that integration capacitor with charge, we short it out to ground, right? So we drain it out. But if we don't give it enough time in between frames to reset, there may be residual charge in there. So the next frame already has some residual charge from the previous frame. And then the frame after that might have some additional residual charge. So you kind of have this residual charge that goes back to infinity, if you think about it that way. Um, so where I'm coming from here is, can we get accurate temperature measurement for that exact frame if we have residual charge because we didn't give our readout enough time to reset? And so you get questionable accuracy when you push the limits too far um, on some of these uh, infrared detectors. And it, it's part of the physics that are just baked in, into the, what we're doing here. So something to think about on that end. Another one is we talked about what if we have a colder target, but we need short integration times, right? Because we want fast frame rates. Now we're working at the low end of the well fill. Well, as it turns out, um, previous generation inter, uh, infrared detectors were not linear to low well fill. And they weren't linear at the top end, too. So what you ran into is when you do a non-uniformity correction, that only maps during the linear portion of the ray. So if you're down at the bottom where it's curved, now the imagery starts looking really bad. And you'll see what it looks like. And then the accuracy falls off, too. So older uh, readout integrated circuit technology was nonlinear at low well fill, which can be problems in high speed thermal cameras. Not with lower speeds, but in the higher speed. Well, the next generation FLIR cameras, we fix this problem. So they're very linear to low well fill, down to just a few hundred counts. So it allows you to be able to capture accurate data even when you're starving for photons. And this is giving you just a quick look at what a non-uniformity correction is. So it sounds really fancy pants, but really it's just every single pixel, <laughs> I haven't used fancy pants in a while, uh, every single pixel responds slightly different. And so to correct for that, we do a, a non-uniformity correction. And it's just a, a slope and offset that we add to each pixel so they respond the same. The imagery on the left has a great non-uniformity correction. The image on the right is no non-uniformity correction. You can see we see vertical striations and some of the processing thinning in there. And so you get into issues where we really can't trust the data. It not only looks bad, but the data is not accurate. So this is give you an idea if we don't have a, a readout circuit that's linear to low well fill, we're going to have problems in our measurements. All right, so we talked a little bit about fast frame rates, snapshot speeds. Now let's take a look at strain layered super lattice, next generation uh, detector materials that we're using in some of the newer FLIR cameras uh, that we're debuting at this show today. So one of the advantages of the long wave infrared is you usually have a lot more photons. So we talked about hotter objects have more photons than colder objects, but the, the photons they emit are not the same in the exact same in, in each spectral band. So if we look at a 30C black body, this is showing you the in-band radiance. You actually get 9.7 times more photons in the long wave band than you do in the mid wave. 
Does that mean the mid-wave won't work? No, it doesn't. It just means you're going to need a little bit longer integration times. So why is this important? Well, if we compare, oh, this chart all goofed up. Okay, so I'll just tell you what it says, and you'll have to trust me through, through all that garbage, uh, how it formatted there. But what we get is much shorter integration times for the long wave SLS than we do from a mid-wave Insby camera. So last year, again, we debuted a high-speed thermal, thermal uh, mid-wave camera, but now with a long wave, we can get even shorter snapshot speeds to allow us to stop motion on those high-speed targets. This is going to be a, oh, this one came out okay, fantastic. Um, the other nice advantage is because the in-band radiance change isn't as dramatic in the long wave as it is in the mid-wave when we go from a cold object to a hot object, we actually get wider temperature bands. So here on the right, you see a mid-wave camera. In some of those temperature ranges, let's just look at uh, the first four, uh, negative 20 Celsius all the way up to 350 Celsius are over four different ranges. We show five, but you could do it with just four. Uh, we can image an object. With the long wave SLS, we see just in one range, we can go from negative 20 to 150, and then in a second range from 55 to 350 Celsius. So we only need two ranges. Why does that matter? Well, again, we're looking at high-speed objects covering a wide temperature range. Uh, the less that we have to cycle through multiple temperature ranges, the faster frame rates we're going to get overall. So again, the long wave uh, gives you wider temperature bands, which helps with our fast, high-speed thermal applications. So is this the same for all long wave detectors? Well, not necessarily. So long wave MCT, FLIR uses some of those in our cameras, and this is one of our cameras. And we can see here, this particular readout with long wave MERCAD has very short uh, temperature ranges, 5 to 50 C, 50 to 150 C, where again, the SLS has a clear, distinct advantage here. So even if you're working in the long wave, the detector material and the readout combination um, are necessary to help you get the best performance. The other nice advantage if we start looking at long wave MERCAD relative to long wave SLS is uniformity. Has anybody used a long wave MERCAD camera? I hope so, we're at like DCS show, so I hope a few people have. And I'm glad the FLIR guy raised his hand because that's a good sign uh, that he's familiar with it. So what we found is when you first boot up MERCAD, the non-uniformity correction, it's, it's like you're doing it for the first time every time. So every time you turn on the camera, you have to do non-uniformity corrections to get a nice clean image. And the image you're seeing here, the coffee cup, is I just booted up the camera and took an image. And you can see it needs some work, right? Now the image on the left is a long wave SLS. Now here I turned on the camera, it cooled down. Uh, it did an internal one point offset update with a paddle, and this is the image I get. So another advantage of long wave SLS, especially for high speed thermal, is that it's more uniform on boot up, so you just turn it on, cool it down, and you're taking measurements especially helpful if you're out in the field and it's not really convenient to do a bunch of non-uniformity correction updates. So these are just some of the uh, improvements with long wave SLS as it pertains to other detector technologies and also for high speed thermal applications. Okay, so now's the part where we're gonna show party snaps, but uh, you know, they, they got packed up with our booth, so they're not here, uh, we don't have them. But we have a really cool video. So this video we took with a high speed FLIR camera, uh, the X69, window down in some instances, but we're going 1,000 frames per second, or in some cases, two or 3,000 frames a second. And then we have it side by side with an IDT high-speed visible camera. And they're both looking at the exact same scene, so kind of bore-sided, and we synchronize them together. So you'll see some of the fun stuff we can do here. So this is about a four-minute video, but I think you're gonna find it exciting. Hello, I'm Ross Overstreet with FLIR Science Segment. Today we're out at a desert test range where we're gonna film some high-speed infrared and high-speed visible. Uh, in particular, we're going to be shooting body armor, taking a look at uh, how the bullets interact with the body armor. I'm going to get up those rocks up there, shoot from one side of the screen to the other and see if we can see bullets in flight. We have a number of customers who are trying to see a bullet in flight. One group of customers wants to inflate airbags or some other means of protecting a VIP or dignitary. The other group wants to automatically respond to the sniper. Another thing we're going to do is shoot some Tannerite. Tannerite is a small explosive that explodes when a bullet hits it, and it's a decent simulant for improvised explosive devices. And we have lots of customers who study IEDs. Another thing we're going to look at is weapon mechanics. We're going to take a look at uh, slide cycling on a couple of pistols and bolt cycling on some AR-15s. 
So here we have the FLIR X6900 SC. This is the fastest full resolution infrared camera on the market. It provides 1,000 frames per second at 640 by 512 resolution. We can window it down and go even faster. For example, at 640 by 256, we can do 2,000 frames per second, and 640 by 128, about 3,800 frames per second. Some of the unique features of this camera is this is our first camera with onboard RAM. We can save 26 seconds of data to the RAM inside the camera. Then we can have it copy that RAM buffer to a solid state hard drive located on the back of the camera. This makes it very easy to offload the data and get it back to a PC. After a number of shots, you can simply pull the solid state hard drive, take it back to a PC for download, stick a new SSD in, and take more recordings. Alternately, if the camera is far away or not in a safe location, we can stream the data out of the camera via gigabit ethernet. The camera beside is a high-speed visible camera from IDT. One of the things that we're doing today is we're going to synchronize thermal and high-speed visible so that they both open their shutter at exactly the same time and run at the same frame rate. This is going to let us get the same data set in both thermal and visible. We think we'll see different types of information in each wave band and they'll be complementary. Another neat feature of this FLIR X6900SC is it has our first in-house designed and built optic on the front. This is the 100 millimeter optic. At the moment we have 25, 50 and 100 available. We have a lot more coming. This one is manual focus, so you twist the focus ring to manually focus it. And it also has a focus lock, so if you don't want it moving around, if you're in a high vibe environment, you can lock the focus. Additional lenses will be computer controlled, so we'll be able to control the focus from a remote location. So kind of some fun uh, video there for you. At this point, uh, I'd like to open it up for Q&A if anybody has any questions. 